grace to you. Excuse me. <laughs> grace to you and peace. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We gather today in sure and certain hope of resurrection. We also gather today to give thanks for the life of a dear mother, a dear grandmother, a dear aunt, a dear family in faith, a dear worker, a servant, a joyful servant, one who trusted in the power of prayer, one who sought prayer for anyone in her life, one who mourned the fact that she couldn't give more and loved the fact that there was always more to give. Amen. Let's proclaim today, friends. Let's proclaim the comfort that we receive from the Holy Spirit. Let's proclaim the good news of eternal life in Christ our Lord. Hear these words from Paul. Paul writes, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves in Christ. In her baptism, Jean was clothed with Christ. And in the day of Christ's coming, she shall be clothed with glory. <clears throat> Hear also these words from John's Gospel. Where John writes, I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, we bless you for the great company of all who have kept their faith and finished their race and who now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name right now in our hearts before you. Especially, O oh God, we thank you for Jean, whom you've now received into your presence and into your peace. Help us to believe where we have not seen, trusting instead in you to lead us through our years. And bring us at last with all your saints into the joy of your eternal home, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's join together in singing the first hymn, 467.
Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us even in our weaknesses, since he in every respect was tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find help in time of need. Let's confess our sins against God and against neighbor. Will you pray? Uh, join me in prayer. God of mercy, whose loving kindness endures forever, we confess that we have failed to receive and to give love and to care for others as we care for ourselves and to forgive and to accept forgiveness. We remember good intentions that were not put into action, harsh words that were hurtful, selfish purposes that caused pain, persistent pride that would not yield. We acknowledge our fear in the face of death and our failure to accept the hope you offer in Christ Hear us, O Lord, as in this silence you draw our confessions to you. Forgive us, gracious God, and help us to forgive others. Heal us from the pain even of self-condemnation. Free us from the burden of failures that cannot be corrected. Renew us with your loving assurance. Assurance that our sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And may the God of mercy, who forgives all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please be seated. Precious Lord, as we seek wisdom and seek comfort and seek eternity in your word, will you bless us in this short time that more than words on paper, this is life to all that we are and all that we have in what we love on earth and what you love from all the stretches of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. These readings were spoken just a few short years ago at the uh, memorial service in memory of Dearest Jack. From Proverbs. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise dispenses knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perseverance in it breaks the spirit. From the Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Apostle Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have received your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me but had no opportunity to show it. Now that I'm referring, not that I'm referring to being in need, for I've learned to be content with whatever I have, I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. You see, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And in Jesus' words to his disciples at a time of great anxiety and worry and unsuredness, Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. The word of the Lord. I know how deep her thoughts of family were. I know how, for her, the gift of sharing a story was integral to generational connection. I know that a job well done, of which there were many, was a reward in itself. A reward that, coupled with faith, can even stave off the loneliness that might otherwise overwhelm. I even came to learn that, for Jean, the power of a prayer wasn't evidenced by the way one feels in the moment, but by the compassion, the hope, and the love present at its offering. You know, as difficult as it is, I'm glad for those of you, nieces and grandchildren, who will share something deeply meaningful to you today about your dear grandmother, your dear aunt. Your words will provide comfort. They will bring smiles. They will even draw out of all of us here a deeper sense of gratitude. These are all amazing gifts. So for those uh, of us here who will not have opportunity later, I say thank you. At the death of someone whose identity and personality are so closely linked to service in the name of Jesus Christ, I cannot help but marvel at the wisdom granted from Holy Scripture. When Jesus comforts his disciples saying, let not your heart be troubled, he's not trying to tell anyone that our lives are devoid of times of sorrow or sadness or even fear. Jesus would never take that away from us. He would never take away these truths of human life. 
or of human death. Instead, Jesus utters these words to fulfill his mission to bring fullness to our lives. Jesus is the personification of both the eternity and the present in which God dwells. All of Jesus' words and actions serve a purpose in its time, and every word and action is magnified because of its connection to the very first thoughts of God at creation. Earlier I said when thinking about Jean that the power of prayer is evident in the love present at its offering. Well, Jesus offers his caring words to his closest friends and then he turns to God in prayer. He turns to God in a wonderful prayer of thanksgiving in which Jesus recalls all the ways that the father of all of humankind has allowed Jesus to pass on to you and to me the knowledge that love is eternal. And because we have Jesus, we have this eternity with God. And right now we are reminded in that eternity that Jean in eternity is reunited with her husband Jack. And that Jean in now in her eternity is united with her son Craig. A reunion. As if love ever really allows us to grow apart. Jesus comes to us not, friends, as the final actions of a God who has given up on a kingdom people to achieve some level of righteousness. No, very much the other way around. Jesus comes to us as proof that the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who provided life and breath and faith, the God who instituted love and compassion and understanding, did and does all of this with the work, with the hand of the Son and the Spirit. One God now and forever, we say. Wonderful words of benediction, these good words that connect the first thoughts with the eternal thoughts. So friends, in this season of resurrection celebration, we profess that death is not a time to offer final thoughts, but rather a window of opportunity to embrace that which was before the very first statement of faith before the very first singing of the first hymn, even before the tear of the first death. We embrace the love that brought Jean to us, a name and a face that was the very first thought of God. Did you know that you have that much in common with Jean? blessed now that uh, Jean's loving family wishes to come and share. So, excuse me, we have a hymn first. We'll sing first.
I invite Jane and Margaret and Julia and John and Brett and Rebecca. Aunt Jean touched, <laughs> touched so many lives. Her students, many of whom probably remember her kindness and patience. Her neighbors, who became lifelong friends. Her church family, who benefited from her kind words, prayers, and visits. But most important to her was her family. I'm lucky to have been in this last group since the day I was born. There's nothing quite like an aunt. She sees the good things in you without having the responsibility of being your parent. She's like a second mother who always has a kind word or encourages you to do your best. I've been extremely lucky to have had two special aunts in my life, but have lost them both recently. Today I want to share my thoughts and memories of Aunt Jean. I don't need to tell you this, but Aunt Jean was a special lady. You all know it. She always had time for me and my siblings. She did become like a second mother after I lost my mom. We would email or call back and forth to keep each other up on our lives, our children, our grandchildren, and our siblings. Her emails were something else. Even though she was a teacher, her emails didn't show it. <laughs> no capital letters, no punctuation, no paragraphs. <clears throat> it took me a while, but I was usually able to figure out what she was saying. I was just happy enough that she was able to email me. She liked to arrange small get-togethers with family where we would just talk and talk and talk. Before the visit was over, though, and she would get her list and make sure that we talk about everything that she had on that list. <laughs> My brothers and I would sometimes visit Aunt Jean and Uncle Jack for a week in the summer. Those weeks will always hold a special place in my heart. Aunt Jean always planned things that, would be, that we would enjoy doing. Trips to the pool, crafts with neighborhood children in the backyard, wonderful meals, but no dessert before fruit breakfast in bed, and all sorts of just fun things. <coughs> Aunt Jean was very kind to my parents as they aged and were unable to get around much. She would visit them at least every week, bring them things they could use to keep them busy, and give them news of family and Hatfield friends. Even when mom didn't remember the visits, Aunt Jean never stopped. After mom passed, she would visit dad every week. Aunt Jean was such a thoughtful and compassionate lady. When mom and dad were not able to visit my sister Louise's new house, she went over and took pictures inside and out. Her picture showed Louise with a big smile on her face. She showed mom and dad the pictures, and I know that made them feel a lot better. She always called Louise, was available for phone calls from her, visited when she could, and was always happy when we could visit her. She never forgot a birthday or holiday and would send gifts to her gift to her household at Christmas time. And she loved her family. I've heard many, many proud stories of each of her children, grandchildren, spouses, and great-grandchildren children have done. <clears throat> she was comfortable in her love of God was strong, was a strong and quiet believer and servant. Her life can be summed up in something that my sister-in-law Gay once said to me. You've all probably heard that if you have a difficult decision to make, you're supposed to think, what would Jesus do? Well, Gay said that to her, the saying, what would Aunt Jean do, was more appropriate. 
Although we were all extremely lucky to have had Aunt Jean in our lives for as long as we did, it's hard to say goodbye. She will live on, on in the lives of her family and in our memories forever. Uncle Jack, your genie is back by your side. Craig, your mom's with you again. Rest in peace, Aunt Jean. everybody. Aunt Jean set the standard for what a great aunt should be. She was kind, generous, and always supportive. So many of my childhood memories involve Aunt Jean taking us to places like Mary Mead for ice cream, the zoo, local Upper Dublin plays, and screenings of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Sometimes she'd babysit it babysit us in her home in Orland, serving casseroles and tang on fun activity placemats. And as Sarah, my sister, remembers, she'd often send us off with just a bit of homework, too. She was ever the teacher, even outside the classroom. She got us subscriptions to magazines like Ranger Rick when we were young, and when we turned 13, she got a 17 magazine. So cool. Aunt Jean was always pushing us to learn more, do more, and be more. And you always knew she cared. Like her mother, my grandmother, who could multitask with a pair of scissors in one hand and the North Penn reporter in the other, Aunt Jean mastered the art of sending the infamous clipping. She'd snip out articles she knew would mean something to us. Each piece was a little nudge, a way of saying, I'm thinking of you. And just yesterday, when I was in Chestnut Hill, home for, home for this, I discovered a photo album that she had compiled for my wedding. Aunt Jean loved assembling these albums, so many of them. Many of them were annotated with writing, write captions right on the photograph. And tucked within the pages, of course, <laughs> there was, oh gosh, there was a clipping. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Um, Aunt Jean had a knack for making you feel valued. She invested in us, believed in us, in every one of those photographs that she'd take, albums she'd make, every note, every call. She also worried about us, but her concern was always productive. When we moved from Worcester to Chestnut Hill and had a new pool, she fretted about our safety. Little kids, a pool? Just, and just yesterday, I learned from my dad, her brother, who's here, I learned that she secretly arranged for swimming lessons for us. I had no idea Aunt Jean did that until just now. <laughs> Whether I had forgotten or she never sought credit, it was typical of her discreet care. That was Aunt Jean, always looking out for us. Of course, Aunt Jean's hallmark was the annual 4th of July parade, an epic celebration that captured the essence of summer and family. She orchestrated everything with the precision of a modest parade marshal from the early morning breakfast of Sanka and shoe fly pie, to monitoring Aunt Uncle Jack's grilled chicken and hot dogs, to the beer guessing, Jane always won. <laughs> Sorry, Jane. <laughs> Ice cube melting, the room full of prizes. She managed these events quietly with a smile, ensuring everyone cherished those moments as much as the food. And let it be said that Aunt Jean was funny. She had a surprising with it wit that always told you she was paying attention to everything. I wanted to share a few words from my dad, who is here today. Of course, we've heard so many stories about their sibling bond and occasional ri rivalry over the years. Dad says, she was my best friend when I was in trouble. Four years older than me, she always had appropriate teenage wisdom to share, and it hasn't changed at all over the years. We had many phone calls, only weeks, and even a few days before she passed, she was still looking out for me. He smiled as he mentioned, we finally settled an old dispute about what I owed her for taking care of my rabbits. <laughs> whether, whether it was 15 cents or 25 cents, we decided the matter was settled. <laughs> 
Aunt Jean was truly one of a kind, not just an aunt, but a model of dedication, a beacon of love, and a relentless cheerleader for all of us. She taught me what it means to be an aunt, and more importantly, what it means to be part of a family. Here's to Aunt Jean, whose love and lessons will continue to guide us. My name is Rebecca, and I'm the youngest of Jean Badger's four grandchildren. On behalf of our family, I would like to take a moment to thank you all for coming today to honor the life of our grandmother. Graham was truly a friend to all. As I look around the sanctuary, I see so many people my grandmother loved. Thank you all for supporting her, caring for her, and sharing experiences with her. To our grandmother's Carmel Church family and her friends from Gwinnett Estates, Please know how much you meant to her. She thought of you, worried about you, prayed for you, and loved each of you. Also to the ACT staff who took care, who helped and cared for our grandmother in one way or another over the last 17 years, thank you. We always knew that she was in wonderful, attentive hands, living in a beautiful home that she was so proud of. My sister Julia, my cousins Jack and Brett and I, were truly blessed to have had so many wonderful years with our Graham. From sleepovers, countless meals and holidays at Graham's, to family vacations and overseas trip slideshows, we are lucky to have made memories together that so many can only dream of. The four of us like to joke that we are each Graham's favorite. If I'm being honest, I'm not sure that any of us are wrong. Graham loved us all so much and treasured the relationship that she had with each of us. As you listen to our stories today, you will truly feel just how much we love, appreciate, admire, and miss her. She was one of a kind and will always hold a very special place in our hearts. Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Julia Jean, middle name after this wonderful woman that we are here to honor today, Jean Badger who was also affectionately known to others as Jean, Jean Jean the Jellybean, Jeannie, Aunt Jean, Mrs. Badger, Mrs. B, Mom, and best of all, and my most favorite, Graham. However, even though that's my most favorite, she might have slightly preferred over all the others and taken the largest shining to the name she was given most recently by four very special little boys, Great Graham. Graham was somehow able to effortlessly weave love and care into every interaction she had making each person she came into contact with feel cherished and valued. She touched the hearts of all who knew her with her caring nature and gentle spirit. Graham's kindness knew no bounds, and her generosity was a beacon that illuminated the path for many. As an educator, Graham's thirst for knowledge was insatiable. She embraced the new with eagerness. Sometimes she had trouble with email. <laughs> all while ensuring that those around her were informed and inspired as well. Whenever you came around to see her, she would have an article or two cut out of the newspaper labeled with your name because a topic, the topic or a word she read in it reminded her of you or something you told her somewhere along the way that you were interested in. Graham had a funny way of garnering assistance with certain tasks, such as changing the ink in her printer. She would invite you over for lunch and then say, well, while you're here, <laughs> If you didn't come for a meal, you still couldn't visit without eating, as she would always have clementine sections and apple slices ready for you to eat while you chatted and visited. Her simple yet profound model of, motto of fruit before cookies, as well as the joy she found in visiting, reflected her belief in the importance of health and nourishment, not just for the body, but for the soul. Graham wanted you to know that she was thinking about you. My husband Kevin and I might be the only people left who have a home phone, although we never use it and I truly don't know the number. <clears throat> that did not stop Graham from calling me and leaving messages on the phone. Want to know how? Because, again, I don't know the number. She called the operator. <laughs> uh. 
That's right. She wanted to, me to know so badly that she was thinking of me that she called the operator to get her home telephone number and left me a message just to say hi and to tell me that's how she got the number. A year or so later, I received another message from her, very carefully and cautiously reading Granddad's apple pie recipe for me so that I could make it for Thanksgiving. It was not a Badger or Detweiler family event without Graham and her camera. Her camera, which luckily was a tool of memory preservation, captured moments of joy and togetherness, weaving a tapestry of memories that we hold close in our hearts. In the more recent years, as digital cameras became more and more popular, Graham tried, again, eager to learn the new, and succeeded with using one. However, most, most recently, she was much more comfortable with allowing someone else to take pictures for her, which allowed us to finally have some pictures with her in them. Graham's legacy, one of generosity and thoughtfulness, transcends time, echoing the stories we share and the lives she enriched. Though she may have passed from our sight, her spirit, her love, and her essence remain eternally present, guiding us forward with her wisdom and grace. In remembering Graham today and always, let us treasure the memories we hold, the lessons we've learned, and the love she so generously bestowed upon each and every one of us. As we mourn the loss of this extraordinary soul, let us remember Graham for the countless little gestures of love and kindness that she showed to us, as well as let us remember that, that from her warm smile to her, her encouraging words, she made the world a better place with her presence. And let us honor her by embodying the same values of compassion, generosity, and love that she exemplified throughout her life. Although Graham may no longer be with us in body, <clears throat> sorry, her spirit will continue to live on in our hearts and memories. As A.A. A. Milne once said through Winnie the Pooh, how lucky am I to have had something to, that makes saying goodbye so hard. Graham, you left an indelible mark on all of us, and we will carry your memory with us always. And, as Jean Badger would say, right, right, love you. Good morning. Thank you for joining my family and I in celebrating my grandmom's remarkable life and legacy. Graham, as my brother, cousins, and I adoringly referred to her, was and will always be a supportive fixture in our lives. Side by side, hand in hand with our granddad, the other hand on our camera taking pictures, she was in attendance for what seemed like every significant moment in our lives, from performances to graduations, sporting events to weddings, birthdays to holidays. Every moment shared with her was special in ways that transcended time. To borrow a famous oft-referenced quote from Maya Angelou, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. When applied to Graham, everything she said did or made me feel is unforgettable. Her greatest gift was making a person feel like they belonged and had worth. I was recently trying to describe Graham to a close friend who had never met her and stumbled into a simple, cogent way to capture her memory. Every conversation with her existed in a vacuum where the stressors, pressures, and fears of life were checked at the door and you could open your heart and know that she would protect and respect it. In those conversations, it felt like there were no interruptions or distractions. She genuinely wanted to learn about you, encourage and reassure you if you were facing internal or external adversity and remind that she loved you even when you didn't love yourself. In my dad, Craig Badger's tribute to my granddad at his memorial service nearly five years ago, he shared his view of heaven as being a place where time and age are immaterial, a spiritual view I've come to share. It gives me comfort and joy to think of her being able to relive every aspect of her beautiful life over and over. In the company of so many loved ones, she cherished to have preceded her in passing and will embrace her again. To close this eulogy, I offer some endearing, enduring lessons that my Graham, forever a teacher, has taught us by virtue of her life lived. Your education is lifelong. Treasure your family and friends. Be a mindful, patient listener. Stay informed and engaged. And never stop traveling and seeking adventure. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Sorry. Have you ever met someone who just radiated warmth? And that was my grandma. She was the epitome of what a human being should be, infinitely kind 
endlessly patient, not just with her family or us grandkids, but with everyone. Selfless and community-minded, she made meaningful connections wherever she went. Her boundless curiosity fueled her love for travel, something she enjoyed documenting and sharing with us. Her photo slideshows and taped voiceovers filled us with wonder, inspiring me to explore the world and document my own journey. During my honeymoon with my wife last year, I always had my camera out capturing every moment. When a fellow traveler asked me if I was filming for YouTube, I shook my head and, and proudly said, no, this is for my grandma. She was also an incredible teacher. Her skills on display during many evenings spent at their dining room table where she patiently helped me with reading, writing, spelling, and math, some of which I was better at than others, but with her guidance soon began to excel at and enjoy. Even at the end, she knew how much I learned, uh, loved learning and would save newsletters and uh, newspaper clippings, as mentioned many times, uh, that she thought I would find interesting, always marking them with her unmistakable handwriting, handing them over with a smile each time I visited. There are countless things I'm thankful for and will miss about my grandma, but perhaps the most important is how safe and loved she made me feel. I'll never forget you, Grandma. Thank you for everything. And until we meet again, rest in peace. As our family sat around her hospital bed and said our tear-filled goodbyes to Graham, it hit me just how incredibly lucky I was to have had my grandmother with me for 32 years. Not only with me, but she was an integral, close part of my life. And it would be a complete understatement to say that without her here, I feel a hole in my heart. The world just feels a little different without Graham in it. Some of my childhood friends got to visit their grandparents in Florida. And as a kid, I was jealous of them. But as I matured, I realized just how special it was to have grandparents so invested in my life. I had my grandparents all the time. They really knew us our interests, our likes and dislikes, and who our friends were. And we really got to know who our grandparents were, their values, beliefs, sense of humor, and hobbies. Most of all, we got to know their hearts. I think it's rare for a relationship between a grandparent and a grandchild to be so essential and so long-lasting. But then again, Graham was exceptional in every way. I am truly so lucky to have had a grandmother who cared and loved so deeply. I vividly remember the details of the weekly Wednesday evenings that my sister and I spent at Graham and Granddad's house. We got off the bus, walked to their house, had a snack, and did our homework with Granddad while Graham made dinner. Graham usually switched back and forth between my sister's favorite meals and mine. After dinner, we always got a special dessert and then she took us to church choir practice. To get my throat ready to sing, Graham pulled a Luden's cherry cough drop from her purse and handed, handed it to me in the back seat for LeSabre. I have no idea how much Graham and Granddad liked the meals that Julia and I liked, or if schlepping us to and from choir was enjoyable. But Graham always made us feel so well taken care of. To celebrate my 21st birthday, my grandmother made plans for a special tea party luncheon. It was on my actual birthday, which I had celebrated the night before. You can all imagine the shape that I was in. <laughs> I called Graham that morning. She answered the phone with such a cheerful voice. And when I told her I wasn't feeling well, she didn't ask a single question. She simply said she would push, push the reservation back a few hours if I thought I would be feeling better by then. I agreed. And when she picked me up, there was a bucket in the front seat of the car. <laughs> She didn't say a word about it. It was just there. Even though I know the state I was in that morning had disappointed her, Graham never once said a harsh word about it. You see, the kind of love that Graham felt for us was a love without condition. She may not have approved of everything we did and may not have liked some of the decisions we made, but she didn't lecture, she didn't judge. She just kept loving us letting us know that she was there, and if we ever needed her, we could count on her to listen, to comfort, and to help. What made Graham so special, so wonderful? Her heart. She was the epitome of sincerity, hospitality, grace, and understanding. 
She was the kind of person who just had more love in her heart, no matter how many people she met. Friends became family because of her. She took in all of our spouses as if they were her own grandchildren. And truthfully, watching her become a great grandmother was one of the most special things I have ever witnessed. From my grandmother, I learned where I come from. I learned my history. I learned who I am and who I want to become. It didn't take much to make her happy. A phone call, a card, a visit, or a hug before saying goodbye. Graham lived to make other people's lives better. To think that someone like her felt that way about us should comfort all of us. We can never forget that there is a part of her in each of us, something that she gave to us and asked nothing for in return. What we inherited from Graham cannot be damaged, destroyed, or lost. It is permanent, and it keeps her from becoming just a wonderful memory. It allows her to remain just as alive as always, alive through us. There will be times in our lives when we'll want to talk to her, be with her, or ask her what we should do. I hope that when those times come, we, be we can begin to look at each other and find the part of Graham that she gave to each of us. Maybe we can learn to lean on each other the way we always knew that we could lean on her. Maybe then she won't seem quite so far away. <laughs> Live like Graham. It sounds like a tagline that should be on a bracelet or a t-shirt. Maybe it should be, be a good reminder for all of us. <laughs> Love like Graham. Care like Graham. Laugh like Graham. The world would be a better place if we could all be like Graham. So for your wisdom, your humor, tender heart and compassion, your understanding, your patience, and your love. Thank you, Graham. You shaped who I am. You shaped who my children are. You influenced us all so greatly. The mold was certainly broken with you. I miss you, and I love you. Amen. <laughs> Remain seated, but turn in your bulletin to this wonderful litany. If you'll read the, the words in bold. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember them. In the opening of buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember them. I'm sorry, I lost my place. What when we are weary, when we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we have joys, we yearn to share, we remember them. It is the Lord alone who makes us bold to pray. Trust the Lord's hand on our hearts as we bring these thoughts, these eternal thoughts. Let us pray. O oh God, before whom all generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived this life in faith, live now eternally with you. And again, O oh God, especially this day, we thank you for your servant, Jean, whose baptism is now complete in death, 
We praise you for the gift of her life, for all in her that was good and kind and faithful, for the grace you gave her that kindled in her the love of your dear name and enabled her to serve you faithfully. And we remember, O oh God, with deepest gratitude how that faith was witnessed to us. In someone whose very character was one of always looking out for those around her, always keeping an open ear for what was about to happen and how to make it an even better experience for everyone involved. The witness of someone who was the professional preparer of welcoming spaces, able to lift every heart to a space where they felt highest. The one who had the gift of forethought. The one who never forgot the follow-up note. The original community clipper who became even this church's historian. For the one whose faith never was in doubt even as she learned a new life without her dear husband Jack, even as she never got over mourning the loss of her dear Craig. We find more than a piece of comfort knowing that these are reunited and that more gifts of forethought have come into our sight as we consider the truest and most beautiful gifts of your eternity. We thank you for all in Jean. We thank you that in her death is past and all pain is ended. And that she has now entered into the joy that you have prepared. We pray all of this through our tears and in our chuckles and in our memories. Trusting in the gracious mercies of God. And in Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may stand if you like. You only are immortal, O Lord, creator and maker of all. We are just mortals, formed of the earth, and to earth we shall return. You ordained this, saying, you are dust, and to dust. So all of us go down to dust, yet even at the grave we proclaim our song. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. So into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Jean. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sin of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints of light. Amen and amen. And the God of peace that holds us in every good thing, that we may do the will of our Lord, working with us to do all that is pleasing in the Lord's sight, through Jesus Christ, to him alone be all the glory, honor, and power forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. 